Hello, my name is Kate and I'm a professor in the French department at Warwick as well as head of the School of Modern Languages and Cultures. This presentation will give you a flavour of some of the French modules you could study here alongside French language, what we sometimes refer to as culture modules. If you've not already taken a look at the French language presentation, you might like to do that after you've finished with this one. I'll talk first about what French culture modules are, how they fit into our programmes and how many of these modules you may be able to take. Then we'll give you a flavour of our first year programme and the options you could choose in later years. In the course of this presentation you'll be hearing from some of my colleagues about the subjects they teach. The difference between French culture modules and French language modules is partly one of focus. Though you'll study aspects of French culture in your language classes, you won't be going into those topics in as much depth as you would on culture modules. Deepening your understanding of the contexts in which French has been used will make you a better linguist as well as a better cultural analyst. What we aim to foster in all of our students is a desire to explore areas of French and Francophone culture that spark their interest, as well as developing their language skills. Culture modules in the French department here cover a wide range of things, including politics, history, literature, visual culture, philosophy, translation studies and linguistics. We have specialists who work on different periods of French and Francophone history, from the Middle Ages to the contemporary, and who cover different parts of the French-speaking world, including Africa and the Caribbean. One of the distinctive features of the French programme at Warwick is its combination of more established areas of study and research with innovative approaches and new ways of thinking. You could find yourself taking a class on French cultural perceptions of women's madness in the 19th century, analysing the depiction of race and gender in medieval sources, or studying the post-truth mass media age in French. We have specialists here who work on traditional subjects, but who do that in innovative ways. We bring that to the modules we teach and to the research we share with our students. Another distinctive feature of our programmes is that we give you the freedom to focus on the things that interest you most, whether that be language and linguistics or history, politics and literature. That means that students studying French take many different routes through their degrees and are able to shape their studies around their interests in other subjects. How many culture modules you can take in a given year will depend on your degree programme. French language will constitute 25% of your time in every year of study on campus. If you're taking other subjects and or other languages, you'll have compulsory modules for those too. Whatever credits you have left can be used to take culture modules. That number will be higher for single honours students than for someone combining French with one or two other subjects. French studies single honours students will have 90 credits to spend on culture modules. That equates to up to five options each year in addition to French language. The idea of our first year programme is that it prepares you for selecting modules later on by introducing you to a range of topics and types of material that you could study in years two and four. It also gives you a grounding in the essential analytical and research skills you'll need for your studies. For example, the story of modern France is a popular first year module that explores the complex development of France and of French identity from the Middle Ages to the present. Let's hear from Jessica as to what the module is like. Hello, I'm Jessica Wardo. I'm one of the lecturers for the story of modern France. So we've recently redesigned and updated this module to focus on some of the major landmarks in the creation of modern French identity. And we look at texts all the way from the medieval Chanson de Roland, which we see here at the top of the slide, right the way up to the songs of the contemporary rap artist and cultural commentator Abd al-Malik. So this is a module that introduces you to a rich variety of texts drawn from literature, music, film, to politics, philosophy and history. At the same time, it also introduces you to the critical tools you need to analyse those texts. So it's a module that introduces you to questions of method alongside this rich variety of material in French. Now, one of our aims in this module is to explore what it means to be French, 
by looking at some of the major ideas and narratives and experiences that have shaped French identity, including revolution, war, resistance, colonialism. And we focus not only on the grand narratives, but also on how these intersected with and were reframed by individual experiences and trajectories. So, for example, we might look at what resistance meant for Charles de Gaulle, leader of the Free French during the Second World War, but also what it meant for Lucie Aubrac, a young mother fighting with her husband Raymond against the Nazi occupiers. Or we might look at what colonialism meant for the Governor General of Algeria in the 1950s, and then at what it means today for the French citizens who are the children and grandchildren of Algerian immigrants. To understand these stories of modern France, we need to learn the language in which they're told. And by this I don't just mean the French language, I mean the language of the images and the symbols that bring these stories to life. So, to understand a little bit how learning his about history and symbolism can enrich our understanding of contemporary French politics, we're going to focus in now on a piece of street art from Paris in 2019. And I'd like you to see which French symbols you recognise in this picture. And you might want to pause the video at this point just to look at the picture in a bit more detail and jot down some thoughts. So here are some of the things you might have noticed. I'm sure you picked up on the tricolore, the national flag, which we see here at the top. You'll also have noticed, I'm sure, the gilet jaune, the yellow vest, which is a very important symbol of protest since the unrest of autumn winter 2018. Now, you might perhaps have noticed the Phrygian bonnet, even if you didn't know its name. So that's the red cap we see here worn by the figure of liberty uh, in this picture. And this was worn by freed slaves in antiquity. And so the French revolutionaries of 1789 took it up as this very powerful symbol of freedom. And you'll often see it um, in Republican imagery worn by this female figure of liberty or Marianne, for example, on French stamps. Lastly, you might also have noticed the raised fist here, not specifically French, of course, as a symbol of protest, um, but very often seen in street protests in France. Perhaps you realise that this painting is actually borrowing from a 19th century painting by Eugène Delacroix, which is what we see here on the left. It's called Liberty Guiding the People, and it was created to celebrate the revolution of 1830. So here we've got the two pictures side by side, and you'll see that although they're very similar in terms of composition, there are also some striking differences in terms of the dress, the colour, the background. So I'd like to go a little bit deeper now in our analysis of this piece of street art of 2019. Why do you think this piece of street art is borrowing from a 19th century painting? What do you think this tells us about contemporary French politics? And again, you might just wish to pause the video here and jot down some thoughts. So the first thing to say is that actually this painting by Delacroix is very often reproduced and parodied in political imagery, even in advertising. So it's become part of what we might call the French cultural imaginary. So to really understand contemporary French politics, it's important if we can read, as it were, these cultural references and associations. What do we learn here then a bit more specifically about contemporary French culture? I think we learn something about the enduring power of certain symbols of revolt and particularly the importance of this female figure of Liberty or Marianne that we see in the two pictures. We also learn something about how revolution is organised and experienced and depicted and something about the importance of the people taking ownership of the streets of Paris, echoing the revolutions of the past. And did these masks worn by the protesters perhaps strike you as even more contemporary? They almost look as if they're fighting coronavirus, don't they, rather than police tear gas. 
So perhaps this image from 2019 tells us something about the malleability of imagery across time and space. This is a picture that resonates with the past, but also, and in ways that the artist couldn't possibly have anticipated, with the future. Thank you very much for joining me for this mini taster. I'm now going to hand back to Kate Asprey, who will talk you through the modules available here at Warwick beyond the first year. In your intermediate and final years, you have a wider range of choice in the modules you take. This enables you to curate your degree in a way that reflects your own interests. You can either choose to specialise in a particular area, or you can explore a range of different things. It's up to you. We offer modules in politics and society, contemporary French culture, philosophy, French and Francophone literatures, cinema, visual culture and media, post-colonial studies, French and Francophone history from the Middle Ages to the present day, translation studies and French linguistics. You can see a selection of the culture modules we offer on our web pages. You'll be taught by specialists regardless of what you choose to study here. Staff are all experts in their field and the department is known for research excellence, both nationally and internationally. For the last part of this presentation, I'm going to hand over to Jerry, one of our politics specialists, who will give you an insight into what you might be doing on a politics module at more advanced levels of your degree. Hi, I'm um, Jeremy O'Hearn. I work uh, in French in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures. I'm just going to try and give you a sense of the kinds of questions and material we'd be dealing with uh, when we, if you did one of our culture and politics modules, in this case, uh, looking at French presidents and the media uh, in uh, contemporary France. Now, the thing to remember about French presidents compared to, say, a UK prime minister is that they're personally elected under their own name as leaders of the nation, and so that carries a particular heavy symbolic role. And one of the things we try to look at is how they try to combine two apparently contradictory uh, requirements. They have to be both above the fray, as it were, charismatic leaders above uh, the nation they're leading, but somehow they have to be among the people, in touch with the people. And we follow three to see how they try to uh, satisfy those two uh, demands. Now, one of the difficulties that subsequent presidents, after the very first president, Charles de Gaulle, uh, of the French Fifth Republic have had to face is simply the fact that they're not de Gaulle. His shadow is very long. Uh, de Gaulle, already when he became the first president of the Fifth Republic in 1958, already had a mythic status because all the way through World War II he'd been head of the French resistance, um, head of the Free French. That meant when he finally became the first president of the Fifth Republic in 1958, he could almost take for granted that intrinsic connection to uh, the French nation and he was able to assert fairly forthrightly a kind of vertical authority when he had to, whether that meant dealing with the mutinous uh, French generals of the army over the Algerian crisis or even if it meant unilaterally declaring as he's doing here uh, that the UK could not enter the European community. So. Um, that forthright assertion of authority came relatively easily to de Gaulle. It did start to become a problem uh, in the latter years of his rule, and we'd look at these caricatures like this one, which satirised uh, de Gaulle's unilateral, excessive control of the media. For example, with de Gaulle almost like a robot. You can see his characteristic cap there and his control over uh, the ORTF, the equivalent of the French uh, BBC at the time. Going on to subsequent presidents, they've struggled more than de Gaulle had to with combining that, the kind of demands of being above the fray but among the people at the same time. And certainly it's very interesting to look at how the aristocratic Giscard d'Estaing during the 70s uh, struggled really awkwardly but interestingly to portray himself as a sort of would-be man of the people, whether it's staged football matches where he's playing rather awkwardly, uh, having an interview in the shower with a bare top torso afterwards, playing the accordion, inviting dustmen to the Elysee Palace for dinner, uh, or even inviting a sort of deliberately representative statistical sample of the French people for uh, a television uh, conversation here. That's the kind of things we'd be looking through. Um, coming to subsequent presidents who have tried different experiments, if you like, for combining the horizontal and the vertical challenges uh, that face them. 
Um, François Mitterrand was a very cool customer, in many ways adopted a rather successful strategy of trying to incarnate uh, la force tranquille, a kind of calm strength. He was very keen not to be swept up by the, if you like, the frenesy of the, the media. Uh, he wanted to be the maître des horloges, the master of the clocks. He wanted to do things on his own rhythms. And so he would appear in the media relatively rarely when he wanted to and with a certain amount of impact. Now, interestingly, it, we can explore how different presidents sometimes explore the same uh, strategies, but uh, with uh, greater or lesser effect. So Chirac, with the very same um, uh, public relations advisor, tried to adopt the same strategy as Mitterrand uh, of rare but impactful media appearances, but unfortunately he came to seem simply remote, isolated, not all that impactful. Here we'd look at a famous uh, media programme towards the end of his time in uh, office where he's trying to connect to the French, to uh, a friend, uh, an audience of young French people trying to persuade them to make a vote in favour of a referendum for a new European constitution and simply failing to get across and confessing that he simply didn't understand them. Okay? And in the end, for Chirac, his spitting image puppet ended up uh, probably being more uh, popular than he had been. Uh, subsequent presidential experiments in trying to, as it were, dominate the media, if you like. Uh, Nicolas Sarkozy famously referred to as the hyper-president over his period in office, was probably the first president really to try to adopt a style that was going to engage in a multi-channel, 24 roll rolling news kind of uh, culture, trying to stage impactful uh, kind of events almost every evening that journalists would want to cover, and indeed they did, whether it was photo opportunities with his show business wife, the singer Carla Bruni, uh, Sarkozy at the Tour de France, or deliberately staging confrontational uh, exchanges with uh, inhabitants of rundown suburbs. And that, to an extent, worked. The media really did want to cover him, pretty much every evening it became a kind of rolling soap opera. But the trouble is, it worked, or he was always the story, but in some ways, in ways that he didn't want to be the story. And so the media were equally interested in his gaffes when he made them. For example, compulsively checking his mobile phone when he should have been listening to the Pope in Rome, or uh, being caught on camera, on mobile phone camera, insulting under his breath uh, a member of the public. After all that, rather frenetic uh, experiment with a new television style, François Hollande, perhaps reasonably apparently to start with, thought that actually the French might be a bit tired of all that and they would want simply an ordinary president who would simply be like anybody else. And uh, you might have thought that would play well, but interestingly over his five years as president, it started to play actually very badly for a number of reasons. Part of that was the sense that he wasn't filling the shoes of the office of the presidency. It wasn't, sometimes this was unfortunate. For example, uh, Hollande didn't like the idea of somebody standing next to him holding an umbrella during public events. But unfortunately, this meant he often cut a rather sorry and bedraggled uh, figure at such events. All this leads to our final, as it were, current presidential experiment, which is uh, Emmanuel Macron, um, who probably accurately to begin with diagnosed that there was a hunger among the electorate for somebody who might be an upfront, unabashed leader in the Gaullist Mitterrandian style, and so presented himself basically as what he called a Jupiterian uh, president. Jupiter, you might remember, was in ancient Rome the king of the gods. And this perhaps can be seen also in his victory speech when he became president in front of the, the pyramid with its, its echoes of the, Egyptian, um, of the Egyptian pharaohs. So he was going to accentuate that sort of vertical dimension of authority. This too, though, interestingly backfires because it almost completely neglects that, that requirement to show yourself in touch, in contact with ordinary people. And this was a lot of what was behind the vast gilet jaune, the yellow vests uh, demonstrations that soon started to undermine his presidency, this sense that he had neglected the interests, the needs, the desires of ordinary people. And interestingly, their desires are expressed precisely as a requirement that he come down from his high pedestal. Emmanuel, tu descends. Okay? 
and that's partly what we've been seeing over the last couple of years is attempts to negotiate that. So I hope that just gives you an idea of the kinds of images, the kinds of language uh, we'd be looking at uh, when we looked at French presidents and their media strategies in this particular uh, culture and politics module. I hope that's given you a flavour of what our French programme can offer. Do take a look at our other presentation on French language if you haven't already. We look forward to meeting you soon. Merci et à bientôt.